stuff down there and praising the Lord. And, and you just stop and... <laughs> Hallelujah. And then I'm breaking equipment. A couple things before I jump right into this message. One, give these guys another praise the Lord. Thanks for being here, ministering to us today. A couple things. One is, this afternoon we're doing a 101 class. There's still room for you. If you want to come, be a part of 101. Maybe you've been around here a long time. You still haven't come to 101. You need to be a part of this class to find out what Believer's Fellowship is all about and a vision for this church and how this church functions, how it operates, our belief statement. Uh, about an hour and a half of just ministry time. I'll teach this class. We have a good time with the Lord. There'll be some refreshments. We have child care. But we need to know you're coming. Uh, we've already gotten ready for those who are attending. But it's not too late. Just take that out of your bulletin and uh, slip it in the offering box. Make sure we have enough workbooks and all the things that are necessary in child care. So be sure and get signed up today. It isn't too late. We want to see you part of this class. It's a good time of ministry. It's also just a good time to get your 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 passion restirred, all right, and get excited about the Lord Jesus. And there's one mistake in the bulletin. Thacy always loves it when I point out a mistake. Uh, the very first in the insert, it is not September 19th, it is August 19th, all right? That is next Sunday. Uh, my brother's going to be here, he'll be preaching. Uh, he told me, I said, what are you going to preach on? He wouldn't tell me. And then he said something like, it's not what you know, it's who you know. I said... I said, is that just personal counsel or is that the title? So anyway, it'll be a good time in the Lord, a good message. Bring someone with you. Phil's just a great evangelist as well. So uh, this might be the Sunday they give their life to Jesus or get right with God. So be here. Bring someone with you. Encourage folks to be here. It's going to be a great time of the Lord. Also coming up here in a, uh, this next month, we're going to be participating in what's known as National Back to Church Sunday, which is September the 16th, all right? Mark that down in your calendar. You're going to be here at home at Believer's Fellowship that Sunday. But put something else beside on your calendar. Don't forget to bring as many people as possible. All around you, you have friends and people and relatives that have been out of church. Some of them don't go to Believer's Fellowship. Some may go to church here. Uh, you need to locate those people, encourage them to be here. We're going to have a glorious reunion day. It's going to be a good time of folks getting back to church. Summer's over. We'll make sure that everybody's back in the house where they need to be. Amen? And participating in the fellowship and the ministry of the church. So be sure and invite people. Mark this down. Next Sunday, uh, uh, the following Sunday, we're going to have our prayer wall back up, our Jerusalem prayer wall. It'll be time for putting people with a, you have a special burden for, the church can be praying for. Those names are going to go up on the prayer wall. We'll have a time of the service where you can present your names. They'll be on stickies, and we put them all over the prayer wall we have. It covers that whole wall over there. And uh, then I'll come in every week and be praying over those names specifically as well. I'll come in here and commit some time each week to get in here and pray for every name that's on that prayer wall in agreement with you. You don't have to put your name on there, just their name, who you're praying for, especially if they're out of church or, have, you know, or, or backslidden, not right with God, whatever it is, we want to see them get here and get in, in, under the sound of the Word of God again, get excited about Jesus again. Amen? So mark that on your calendar as well. You'll be hearing a whole lot more about that in coming days and coming weeks as we start sharing with you about it. We've been in a series on dealing with morality and moral issues and, and personal purity and virtue of the Christian life and how important it is. And we're living in a day and age when everybody's talking about these issues, especially along the lines of pornography and homosexuality, adultery is rampant, premarital sexual relationships are considered the norm and vogue these days. Uh, every TV you show, every kind of com comedic kind of show that's out there, almost every movie you got people shacking up, you know, and living with each other without any context whatsoever of what, what God would desire for a people or what God would desire for a nation. So I really felt compelled to preach on these particular issues these last several weeks. And we've dealt with them very, very specifically in regard to what does the Bible have to say. Left out my personal opinion is just what does the Scripture say. We know what the culture says, we know what's acceptable, and we know what's going on in the world that we live in. But what does the Bible have to say about these particular issues? You know, the lack of uh, morality, the lack of sexual purity in our society today has become a plague. It's an epidemic. In fact, it's beyond epidemia. It's to pandemia, which means it's completely out of control. Uh, the free love message of the 60s has exploded into the outright hedonism of the century that we are now living in. Well, there is no shame. 
The Bible said it would be like that in the last days. It would be pretty characteristic for the culture, of the, the general culture, the whole world system, to just completely ignore the standards of God's Word. Especially today, the church has been infected by that same mindset and affected by it. And we need to call the church, first and foremost, men and women of God, the young people of God, children of God, back to the place to have some standards in their life, some moral standards. And what are those? Is it what the church says? No, we're getting down to what does the Bible say? And what is God's desire for his people? Now, I've dealt with a lot of stuff, so I'm not going to rehash some of these things. But please understand that God gives these standards. He gives these, these, these commandments. He gives his word always as safeguards. They're there for your protection. They're there for my protection. And so we need to stand according to, uh, and believe according to what the scripture has, not whatever our society is, has uh, deemed acceptable. Uh, and whatever not only deemed acceptable, in fact, our society on certain levels has become extremely proactive and politically active. And uh, so we're, we're, in, a, we're in, a, in, a, in a time of a culture that is so tainted. The Bible says in the last days that sin would abound. Matthew 24 said it, it would be so bad, Jesus speaking on the end times, is it'd be so bad that the love of many, talking about believers, would wax cold. In other words, the passion and the fire that you have for Jesus will not be there like it used to be there. That your, that your, your heartfelt cry for God would be gone. And it's because, he said, the iniquity that, that abounds around us and because of the, of the wickedness of, uh, that's, uh, uh, of men's hearts and how in the last days they become inventors of evil things. And that's the, that's the day we're living in. So it's important that we address these issues and what does God say about them? What does the Bible say about them? What should I believe? Of course, I believe what the Bible has to say, that it is true and it is the Word of God and as it says of itself, that it's an infallible and it's inerrant and it's, it's, it's the acceptable guideline for believers. So we're going to look today at, at two specific passages of Scripture, all right, and two places in the Word of God. And we'll start with, it as we talk about the pathway to purity, now it's the first button on this one, all right. As we talk about the pathway to purity, we're going to find out from these two particular passages, what does God say about our morality? What does He say about virtue? What does He say about purity? And how can we be that way? You know, because if we are so, uh, I mean, if, if we're living in a tainted, sin-filled world, where the images of immorality surround us constantly, how do we maintain any kind of purity? Well, let's start with 2 Peter chapter 3. And it says this in, in 2 Peter chapter, I think it's chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. He tells us here that uh, God's got an answer for us. He says, as His divine power, talking about God's divine power, has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness, through the knowledge of Him, Jesus, who's called us by glory and virtue, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature. Now capture these words in your heart and mind. Having escaped the corruption that's in the world through lust. How in the world are we going to ever escape the corruption? How are we not going to fall into that category of people of the end times whose heart would be waxed over? who would be cold and complacent, filled with, a, with, a, with, a, with a, almost a, a sense of, a, of a spiritual lethargy instead of spiritual passion and spiritual fire. From this verse, it gets very clear that if we'll pay attention to what it's saying, that God has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Now, for those of you who are English majors, that is in the past tense. It means he's already done it. It's already available, that God has already given to us all things that we need to live godly lives and to live pure lives, to live holy and to live godly. God has given to us everything that we need. Well, how has he given to it by us? Well, he's given us these great, exceedingly great, exceedingly great and precious promises. And through these promises, we have everything that we need to be what God has called us to be, that we can literally escape the corruption that's in this world through immorality, and live a life of purity. And last week, I introduced my message with the importance of purity, remember. We talked about that purity is so important in the life of the believer because that is the source of the passion. That's where the fire grows. That's where the flame comes up for, the, for, for honoring God and loving God and glory God and glorifying God. Remember the word we used? Virtue. 
That's why the, the apostle Peter says in this, in this letter to the church, said, listen, the very first thing you add to your faith if you want to be the kind of person who doesn't stumble, the very first thing you add to your faith is virtue. Now, some Bibles translate that word as moral excellence. And that's, that's, that's a nice attempt at it, but it goes beyond just a, 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 an adjective of, 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 of excellence and moral excellence in our life. It really gets down to, I believe, an active word. A virtue means that we have power for living, all right? That we have the unction to function in the spiritual realm. We've got, we've got the gas we need to pour on the spiritual fire in our life so we can keep the passion for Christ burning in our life. But if, if there is no virtue and we open ourselves up to the cultural uh, ungodliness that we're surrounded by, then what happens? Those are the very things that destroy us and those are the very things that rob us of the godly life, the powerful life that God has for us to live. So what we see here is that God's given to us what we need. It's will we embrace it. There's another passage we'll focus on too today in Psalms 119. How can a young man cleanse his ways? A good question, amen. Or a young woman, or an old man, or an old woman. By taking heed according to your word. And this is the very thing that Peter said, by the way. By taking heed according to your word. With my whole heart I have sought you. Let me not wander from your commandments. Your word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. So a godly life is possible. And not only is it possible, it's a gift from God. Not only is it possible, it's a gift from God, but he gives us a clear indication of how we can lay hold of godliness, how we can lay hold of purity through these passages of Scripture. So what I really want you to do today is pay attention Pay attention. God has a word for you, especially if you're struggling in this area and tempted so often in this area and stumbling perhaps in this area, in the, in the things that we have talked about topically from the immorality and pornography and homosexuality and premarital sex and adultery, all these things kind of come under one banner in Scripture. Sometimes it's translated fornication, sometimes it's translated adultery, but there is a word in the Greek language called pornuo. All right? That's the word we get porn from, all right? Pornography. And the whole idea is that God wants us to live a holy life. So I want to live a holy life. If you're a believer, you want to live a holy life. How in the world can I do that? Because I talk to people all the time, say, Pastor, I'm surrounded by all kinds of stuff. Everywhere I turn, everywhere I go, there's all these things that seem to be, it's like swimming up against the tide. You're just pushing against it and it's trying to push you back. How in the world can you live a life? Well, pay attention today. Because there's going to be several things that we'll mention today that could be the most liberating steps that you'll take in your spiritual life. If you'll embrace them and if you'll heed what God is saying to you in this word. In fact, I believe this is such a plague and it's such a difficulty and more people that want to admit it that we just, we have, we are being influenced on levels that we shouldn't have to be influenced on because we're not surrendering our hearts totally to God. So I'm going to ask you to bow your head right quick before we even proceed. And I'm going to ask you to pray a simple word to the Lord. Ask God just simply, would you speak to me? Maybe you come to church often and you just kind of feel it's a waste of time. You don't ever sense really God speaking to you. Why don't you just take a moment right now and say, Lord, I ask you to speak to me. Open my eyes, open my heart. And then just mentally put everything else aside and try to capture what this message has for you today. Lord, speak to me. In Jesus' name, amen. So let's take some, some action here. Let's take some steps of action. I want to be free. I want to walk in the pathway to purity. Then what am I to do? Well, first of all, it starts with confession. We've mentioned this at the end of every sermon, all right? There has to be a time when you come before God and you get honest with God. Never, ever underestimate the power of confession. Now, I know the world says, never underestimate the power of positive confession, all right? But I'm talking about biblical confession, where you claim the Word of God, and you get, say, I want what God has for my life, and so, God, I'm going to come to you, and I'm going to get my heart right with you. And I want to expose everything in me, everything I've hidden, everything I've hidden from you, everything I've hidden from me, you know, everything I didn't want to look at because it's so ugly. I, I'm going to get right with you. I'm going to come into your presence, and I'm going to ask you to open my heart and really let me see what I need to see because I want to confess my sin to you. I love what G. Campbell Morgan said, you know, don't expect God to cover what you're not willing to uncover. Don't ask God to forgive what you're not willing to confess. Don't ask God to heal what you're not willing to lay before him on the altar. And if you are willing to lay it before him on the altar, then God's ready to do something in your life. Remember the promise of 1 John 1, 9. Quoted often in a lot of churches. If 
we confess our sins. If, if, if. And let me say it again. Don't underestimate the power of this point here, folks. When you confess your sins, God tells you very clearly that he's a faithful God. He loves you dearly. He's sacrificed everything for you. You don't have to be afraid to come to him. He's not going to condemn you. He will convict you. But he will also wash you. It says he, will, he is faithful and he's just. He will forgive us of our sins and he will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We don't know what I've done. All unrighteousness. It's bad. All unrighteousness. All unrighteousness. What we must do if we're serious about a walk with God is we've got to come to the place to get honest with God about our sin. It's not popular. It's not being sensitive. It's not being, it's not acceptable to preach this kind of message in churches today. But this is the word that we need to embrace and say, thank God that I can confess my sins to him. And he's faithful to me. He's not going to throw me out when I deserve it. And it doesn't matter how ungodly, how wicked, how immoral, how immoral, how distasteful, how despicable it might be. I am ashamed of it, God. But God says, I love you. I forgive you. And sometimes I really believe that we don't have a proper understanding of God, so we think that somehow if I ever did uncover it all, he'd throw me out. Folks, he knows it all already. In fact, the word confess is the Greek, term, Greek words put together homologous, and it means to say the same thing. It, it means to agree with. So in other words, I'm not just admitting a sin. I am agreeing with God about my sin. God, you said this is destructive. God, you said this brings death. God, you said this pollutes my life. And God, you said that you would forgive me. And God, you said if I confess it. So God, I'm saying what you say. This is wicked, it's ungodly, it's immoral. And I admit I have been guilty of this sin. I ask you in Jesus' name and for what Jesus did and because of all that he did, that you would forgive me of my sin. And name it specifically to him. Confession is powerful. It's incredible what God does. Someone said it like this. Confession is to bring to light the unknown, sometimes the unconscious, the darkness, the underdeveloped creativity of our deep layers. We're just saying, God, peel back the layers. Peel back the layers. Let me see me for what I am and what I've done. I want to confess my sins. Psalms 32, the psalmist put it this way. When I kept silence, my bones waxed old through my roaring all day long. I felt like that yesterday after mowing the yard. <laughs> Don't laugh, I have two and a half acres to mow. <laughs> oh, my bones ache, roaring, oh. Kathy thought I was dying, I think. Walking out, but this is the same thing that sin does to us. It eats away at our heart. If you're a child of God, if you're a Christian, and there's things that are actively, that you're actively doing in your life that you know are contrary to the will of God, your bones are waxing old. David, in another place, said the psalmist said this. He said, it's like a heavy burden over me. I cannot bear up under it any longer. I can't take this. I can't deal with this. And what happens is it gets worse and it gets worse and it's worse. It just doesn't go away. It has to be brought before the light of God to let him see it and let him cleanse it. And then we get a heart drive with God. Psalms 51, what does David say again? This is where he's specifically confessing his sin of immorality against you. You only have I sinned. I've done evil in your sight. Now, he's naming it for what it is. This is sin. It's evil. And if you read the first of Psalms, those first four or five verses of that chapter 51, he just talks about his iniquity, his ungodliness, his, his immorality. His un he just gets specific with God. I've sinned against you. You might be justified when you speak and be clear when you judge. In other words, God, if you judge me for what I've done, I deserve it. But praise God, listen to me carefully. Every judgment has already been poured out for your sin on Jesus. Yeah. He's already taken the brunt of it. He's already taken the pain of it. He's taken the penalty of it. So it starts with confession. Are you willing to have a really good time with God to get down and say, God, I admit my, and name it. And often when people come to me and tell me, Pastor, I don't know what's wrong in my life. I just don't have any spiritual unction, no power, no passion anymore. I give them a little word of advice. I've shared it with you before. I'll say it again because I do it myself. You take some time. You get alone with God, you get your Bible, you get a pencil and a tablet, and you go get a quiet place with God. I don't care what it takes, you go get you a quiet place with God, and you just said, I'm going to stay here. If it's 30 minutes, an hour, hour and a half, two, whatever it takes, until I walk away here, right with God, I'm going to get right with God. And then take your pencil and your piece of paper, 
and begin to write down everything that God begins to show to you. Pray like the psalmist, Lord, show me if there be any harmful way in me and start writing it down. Lord showed me this. Lord showed me I lied. Oh, I called it an exaggeration, but it was a lie. Lord showed me gossip. I called it a prayer request, but it's just gossip. You know, the Lord showed me immorality. Well, I called it entertainment. I mean, God showed me this. What am I going to do? Just write them down. And then you make the list. And then, and, and then just, just stop and say, Lord, is there anything else? And then continue to write. And then wait. God, is there anything? I really want to get my heart completely right with you, Father. And he'll show you some other stuff. And stuff that perhaps just that you become so used to doing that you didn't even see it as sin anymore because it was just a normal, natural part of your life. Because you've rationalized it. You've justified it so many times in your own mind. And what happens is when you do that, deception comes in. So you're asking God to break those barriers of deception and write it down. I just don't have a, I don't have a zeal, God. It's just not there anymore. Write it down. He'll show you. And then when you finish that, turn it over. Write down the rest of it. Until you finish with that list, until God's given you peace about these things that have been laid open and bare, and then you go take that list to your Father. Open your Bible to 1 John 1, 9, read it out loud, and then say, Lord, you said, if I would confess my sin, you would forgive me and cleanse me. I'm ready for forgiveness. I'm ready for cleansing. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read this list. I have sinned against you in, name it. Go down the list. I sinned against you here. I sinned against you by. I sinned against you with. Just down the list. Turn the page over and confess everything that's been written on that page. Name it specifically. And then stop and claim 1 John 1, 9 over all those things. And then tear that list up, destroy it, shred it, burn it, whatever. Because that's exactly what God's done with it. No longer cast as far as the east is from the west into the sea of forgetfulness, the Bible says. I don't even know where that is. I don't want to know. Because I don't want to fish there. Amen? God doesn't fish there. It's done. It's under the blood. Liberation, deliverance, freedom. Now, the next one is, seems to be to be obvious, and I've talked about it briefly last week, and even I think some the week before, is this issue of avoidance. If your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. Throw it away from you. It's more profitable for, you to, for your members to perish than for your body to be cast in hell. If your right hand causes you sin, cut it off, cast it from you. For it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than your whole body be cast into hell. What is he saying here? Got to start plucking out your eyes and cutting off your hands? Well, the problem with that is, folks, if you pluck your right eye out because it's offending you, you only got one eye left. What's going to happen when you... When you sin with that one, then you've got to pluck it out. Now you're completely blind. Same thing, you sin with this hand. Well, you'll sin with that hand. The issue, and he goes on to make this clear through the whole of, of this, this sermon in Matthew, it's an issue of the heart. But what he's saying here at this point is you need to take radical actions in your life. If there are places you go that cause you to fail, then you stay away from those places. If there are people you hang with that cause you to almost hang yourself, you cause you problems, cause you to stumble, cause you to fail, and cause you to fall. You don't need to be best friends with them anymore. If you're dating some guy that's causing you or some girl that's causing you to constantly stay in trouble morally, then you get out of that relationship. Stay away. Don't listen. Don't go there. Don't watch there. Don't handle there. Touch not, taste not, want. just leave it alone is the whole idea here. Psalmist put it this way in Psalms 101.3. He says, I will set nothing wicked before my eyes. In other words, I'm not going to go somewhere where I'll intentionally do something wrong. It's the same thing Job was talking about. He said, I made a covenant with my eyes not to lust upon a young woman. I'm just not going to go there. I like it the way Martin Luther said it. You've probably heard your mama say this at some time. You can't keep the birds from flying over your head, but you can keep them from building a nest in your hair. You can't stop the activities that the world is going to normally, naturally do in, their, in their, their behavior. But hey, you don't have to let it camp in your heart and in your mind and in your life. You make decisions. That's protection against temptation. You know, I love what Mark Twain said. He said, you know, the surest protection against temptation is cowardice. You have to think about that, I'm sure. But the idea is I, I'm, not going to, I'm not going to go there. I, I, I will fall there. You've got to know your own weakness. You've got to know your own limitations. And you've got to realize that, hey, as long as you're in this body, you will be prone to those sins. Well, I'll grow and mature. The flesh never matures. Your soul, spiritual man will mature, but not your flesh, all right? You get one little centimeter away from Jesus, you are just as wicked and apt and vile to do anything you ever did before you met Jesus. Now, some of you think you've arrived. I know that might be, not be some good news. 
But you have to avoid situations that are going to cause your life to be affected or infected by these things. You can't stare in the face of temptation. It's kind of like you've heard me say before, if you're on a diet, you don't stand in the kitchen staring at the refrigerator. All right? It's just not going to work. The third thing, some people have trouble with this, and I want to clarify what I mean. Some people talk about mentoring stuff, but I think there's a point of spiritual partnership that you need. You need to have some senior, spiritually mature, and I'm talking about necessarily age-wise, but spiritually aged people that are, that are stronger Christians than you that you chill with, that you hang with, that you fellowship with. You've got to have people around you that will influence your life in righteous ways and not be there to destroy your life, but also people who can look you in the eye and hear, talk to you and, and straighten you out when you need straightening out and encourage you when you need encouraging. James said, listen, confess your trespasses one to another and pray for one another. I think that's what we're talking about here. You've got to have some people you can trust, some people you know that love you, some people that are not gossips, all right, obviously, but people who really do care about you as an individual and want to see you grow in grace. Proverbs puts it this way, iron sharpens iron, so a man does his, the countenance of his friends. In other words, there needs to be some people around you that can be genuine with you, you can be honest with, who can ask you hard questions, who you can ask hard questions. Now, a lot of times people will say, well, I'm going to partner up with somebody and they're on the same spiritual level with them and they never go anywhere because they're always staying the same old sin. You need somebody who can rebuke you, reprove you, correct you, encourage you, inspire you. That's not going to come with people that are spiritually immature. You need some people you can be accountable to, someone you can sit face to face. You can look eye to eye of that person. You can openly discuss what's going on in your life, where God's got you, and what you're dealing with. I love what one person described this accountability as. I, I, I cut this paragraph. It says, I have a few friends that when we get together, we share our struggles and our weaknesses, and we support one another. I know these guys care about me as a person more than they care about what I, that, that I'm doing right. The accountability is not coming from having a list of questions to answer each week, to make sure that I'm doing everything right. The accountability comes in a form of real, genuine, Christian supportive friendship, knowing this person cares about me and that they're going to pray for me regardless if I've had a rough week or not. You've got to make sure it's obviously somebody who's maturing in Christ and going on with the Lord. You don't want to be caught in that circle. Well, I heard the story about the four preachers, you know. They're all sitting around talking about their church services. And one preacher says, you know what, that might be a good idea. He says, we give invitation to our church, and people come, and they, they, they share with us, and they open their hearts up. Maybe we just need to have a time of confessing one another. James says it's good if we confess our sins to one another. Well, after about an hour of trying to get this influence to happen, they began to get a little free and talk about it and said, well, confession's good for the soul, so, so let's do it. One preacher says, you know, I'll be honest with you. During the week, I sneak out of the office when I should be working, and I go to the movies, and I watch movies. Another one said, well, I ain't tell you this. He said, but uh, I sneak off to the lake and smoke cigars. I like smoking cigars. Third guy says, you know, I'm, you know, I'm into online gambling. I just, it's, it's, I know I shouldn't, but I just, I, I, it's, it's what I do, and, you know, I, I just, I, I just, I'm sorry. Fourth guy wouldn't say anything. They kept prodding him, getting, trying to get him. They pressed him, saying, come on, we confessed our... What's that secret vice in your life? Finally, he answered, said, you know, gentlemen, it's gossiping. <laughs> and I can hardly wait to get out of here. <laughs> there are some friends like that. But that's not the kind of friends we're talking about. Amen? Hebrews 3 puts it this way, exhort one another daily. Exhort one another daily while it's called today. In other words, don't wait for tomorrow to do this. You don't want to be, you want to be hardened, and you don't want others to be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. It is so easy to get wrapped up into justifying our sins that we become hardened and deceived thoroughly. James says this, listen, whoever turns a sinner from the error of his ways will save him from death and will cover a multitude of sins. That's some good news. And we ought to want to be that kind of person. I don't want to be the kind of person that's always needing a Band-Aid. I want to be the kind of person who's applying some of the Band-Aids. 
who's helping other people, who's making a difference in people's lives, who's being a life changer and a life shaper and helping people to know what's right and to know what's wrong and to have power, discover the power of God for doing what's right and wrong. So the first we said is confession. And the second thing we talk about here is that accountability to others. The third thing is the Word of God. And I want to break this down a little bit into three simple points here when I talk about the Word of God. Psalms 119, the scripture we read, gives us a very clear blueprint for sexual purity in your life if this is what you really want to be, what God wants you to be. One, he talked about the importance of heeding the Word of God. The second thing is the importance of seeking God wholeheartedly. And the third part is the importance of hiding God's Word in our heart. Those are three important things. So let me just hit briefly on those as we wrap this message up today because this kind of solidifies it. The first is the importance of hearing the Word of God. And not just hearing it, but to heed the Word of God. The question is asked, how can a young man cleanse his way? New America says, how can a young man keep his way pure? How do you do that? By keeping your way aligning your paths of your life by keeping your life according to what the Bible says. In other words, the Word of God becomes your standard. Not what people say, not what the sex education class said, not what the moral standard of the age might be, but what does the Bible have to say? How do you keep your way pure? In fact, a lot of people, as I said, are not sure who wrote Psalms 119. So it's probably written around 450 B.C. in the time of Ezra and that he might have written this particular psalm. But the idea, as I gleaned from it, was that there were sexual problems then as there are today. There's nothing new under the sun. There were problems. These problems go all the way back to the book of Genesis, all right? Just because you discovered something doesn't mean it's the first time to be discovered. <coughs> the Bible tells us that nothing new under the sun means that the generation before you has done it as well. But what does God's Word say? How do you find purity? What's the pathway to purity? Well, God makes us tell us about making our ways and make our way holy. We said this word before. It doesn't mean just to set apart. It means absolutely unique. You're different. You're not like the rest of the world. And so you're going to say, I want what God wants. How do I know what God wants? Get into God's word. Heed the word of God. <coughs> 2 Timothy 2, 2, flee also youthful lust. And what does that mean? That means run from the things that are going to be giving you problems. So how do I take heed according to God's word? In regard to sexual sins, I run from them. I don't hang around. I don't entertain by them. I just want to call on the Lord, have a pure heart, and be what God's called me to be. St. Augustine said it this way. Habit, I'll let you read it while I get a drink. <coughs> Habit, if not resisted, becomes necessity. And whether you believe it or not, you know, all this sexual sins that build up as strongholds in people's lives and habits, they're there because people made a choice. They, they stepped over that line at some time. They disobeyed God. They did it again and again and again. <clears throat> and soon it became a habit. And they began to just walk it that way as a natural part of their life and resist the Lord. And, but, you know, things about habits, people don't think they're breakable. But any habit is just created by the practice of doing something over and over and over and over again. How do you break a habit? You do just the opposite. Over and over and over and over again. It's like getting a habit to read God's Word. You do it by doing it. And if you make a practice of getting up daily and spending time in God's Word, guess what? You won't have this unnatural habit anymore. You'll have a spiritual habit. <coughs> It'll change your life and transform your, your life. The enemy wants you to believe there's no hope, but there is hope in Christ Jesus. Job was a righteous man. He struggled with this. He said, I've got to, I've got to do something about this. I'm having these impure thoughts. So I'm going to make a covenant with my eyes that I won't sin against God in this particular way. So he, he made a decision. He, he made a choice to do what was right. Could well be you just need to make a choice this morning to do what's right. And you'll find out that 2 Peter chapter 1 is true, that God will give you all things that you need for life and godliness. He'll enable you to do what you need to do through life and godliness. You'll discover the power of God. Even Job had to deal with these issues. First Corinthians, Paul's writing the whole church. He says, flee sexual immorality. Pretty good word. That's how I live my life according to God's word. Every sin a man does is outside the body. But he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. That's a powerful word there, folks. You're sinning against your own body in this regard. Do you not know your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? He's in you, whom you have from God. You're not your own. For you were bought with a price. What price? The blood of Jesus. He gave his body for you. 
Therefore, if your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, then you glorify God in your body and in your spirit. He says, if you choose to sin in the sexual way, then you're profaning this precious temple of God. He's made you the steward. You have the right to rule. The Bible says in the last days that men's gods would be their bellies and their glory would be their shame. Boy, I think of that verse every time I see a gay parade going down the street or hear about a gay pride day. They glory in what they ought to be ashamed of because it's sin against God. Their glory is in their shame. But their God is their what? Their appetites. Their God is their belly. In other words, whatever my body wants, that's what I'll do. When I should be asking, what does God want from my body? And as Romans says, later Paul says, present your body a living sacrifice. This is what God expects you to do. So we've been bought with a price. We glorify God. So we heed God's word, and then we seek God wholeheartedly. He said, with my whole heart, with my whole heart, with my whole heart, I have sought you. Let me not wander from your commandment. When is the last time you committed to say those verse and read that verse and hear that verse and embrace that verse? Say, I want to seek God with my whole heart. This is so vital and so necessary because the God says, if you seek after me, you will find me. If you look for me, you'll discover me. But how do I do that? I listen with my whole heart. Problem is, we're, we're divided in our affections. Jesus talked about it in Matthew. He said, no one can serve two masters. He hates one and loves the other. Or he'll just be loyal to one and despise it. He said, well, I, I'm serving the world and my appetites, I'm, but I serve God. He said, no, you can't do that. You're going to love one, hate the other. He said, if it doesn't get down to love, hate, at least it'll be despising. You'll despise one. In other words, every time the Spirit comes and convicts you and speaks to you about your sin, you don't want to hear it. It upsets you. You don't want to be around. That's why... The seeker sensitive church movement is so popular. They'll fill their churches with 10, 15, 20,000 people on Sunday because they don't want to hear about sin. They don't want to hear about those things because it's, it bothers them. It upsets them. It's uncomfortable. I want to go somewhere I feel happy. Well, get your right heart right with God and you'll be the happiest person in town. That's the key. Just get your heart right with God. That's why I preach this way. I want you to be happy. But happiness comes in the pursuit of holiness, not happiness. So you pursue Jesus. So you take heed with your whole heart. I want with my whole heart to serve God. You say, well, I, you know, I kind of, I, you know, I, I serve God, but. There are no buts to it. This is what the scripture tells us in, in the but category. This is the message which we've heard from Jesus. And we're telling you, God is light, in him's no darkness at all. But if we say we have fellowship with him, I'm what we got, but we're not. We're walking in darkness. We lie and we do not practice the truth. Two things. One, if I say I'm walking with God and I don't, two things here. One, I tell a lie. And other thing is, and I live a lie. I tell a lie, I live a lie. So what's the key to this? Get back to the Word of God. Get back over in the light. Let God expose everything. The answer is simple. God's will is revealed to us through His Word. I take heed to it. I wholeheartedly follow it. And as I do that, revelation comes. And revelation comes, I can embrace life instead of my sin, and find victory. The third part of that was hiding God's word in your heart. Verse 11 says, Your word have I hid in my heart, that I might not sin against you. C.H. Spurgeon summed this up best of all, and he said, verse 11 tells us about the best thing and the best place for the best of purposes. The best thing is what? The word of God. The best place is in your heart. And for the best reason, so you can walk with God, so you cannot sin against God. I mean, that's, this is so important. It's, it's, it's the best thing, God's word, right there placed daily in your heart. And the results of that are the, the sum total of what begins to happen in your life. God uses his word. He reveals himself through his word. He stirs you up the word. You're taking heed. You're obeying it. You're responding to it. And now freedom begins to come. Victory comes. Well, Brother Joe, just, you know, that was written back in the time of Paul. He didn't have TV and topless bars and internet and commercials and Victoria's Secret. All that stuff being paraded for his life all the time. You have to read a little bit of history. You'll see that. Those Thessalonians, he wrote some of these things too in the Corinthians. They were wicked people, and those cities were filled with all kinds of impurity and immorality. They had temples filled with prostitutes, and people would go worship by having sexual acts of immorality. A wicked day, ungodly. There's nothing new under the sun, as I said. Yes, they had problems. I mean, one of the most fascinating reads you'll, you'll do is called The Decline and the Fall of the Roman Empire. And it's a thesis that was written by William Gibbon. And he explains how just decadent the culture had become and how Rome wasn't destroyed from without. 
It wasn't the enemies that came in, the barbarians that overthrew them. It was literally they were destroyed from within. And he, makes, he made six points in his thesis. And here they are. Maybe you read it. Maybe you had not seen them before. But just for a little bit of insight to give you about the culture. He says, there was excessive spending by the central government. Oh, that's not America. We're well beyond excessive. <laughs> Number two was unwillingness for young men to bear arms in defense of their countries. No patriotism left. It's all about me. It's all about mine. I'm not willing to suffer on anybody else for anybody else. Overindulgence in luxuries. Not our culture today at all, is it? Widespread immorality which destroyed, which destroyed the integrity of family life. F fifth thing, gender confusion and homosexuality. The last was disregard for religion. Sounds exactly like where we are as a country. If God doesn't judge this situation. I think it was Ruth Graham said you're going to have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. But judgment is coming, and judgment I already believe is here if you read Romans chapter 1. What's the answer to all this? I think it's like the last song the ensemble sang just a while ago. I need God. I need God. There's no hope. I've tried religion. I've tried being good. I've tried turning over a new leaf. I just need God. I need God, God, God. I need a revival. I need a revival that changes my heart and changes my... I've allowed so much stuff. I've become so desensitized, so immune it seems. I need, I need a fresh move of the Spirit of God in my life. And you know, you can't have that. It really does start with you. It's a choice, just as you made choices to sin against God, you make choices to embrace the Word of God, to give heed to its courage, to obey it wholeheartedly, to put it in your heart that you might not sin against God. I love what Joshua says in his closing days of his life. When he stands before the nation of Israel, he says, Choose for yourself this day whom you will serve, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. In other words, I don't know what you're going to do, but I know what I'm going to do. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to follow Christ. I'm going to give my life totally over to God. I'm going to be what God wants me to be. Me and my house. That's what's going to happen under this roof. We're going to serve God. That's where we're moving forward to. But this is what has to happen. And this is kind of a radical step for some folks because they, they have a trouble praying this. Because they really don't, for whatever, for for. for fear of failure or, you know, lack of understanding about the integrity and the power of Scripture or whatever it is, they don't think it'll work. But it, not it, it is He, and He will work. Charles Finney, the great revivalist in the 19th century, said, Revival is needed. It's the renewal of the first love of Christians resulting in the conversion of sinners to God. In other words, you get so right with God, lost people get saved. It assumes the church is backslidden. And revival means conviction of sin, the searching of hearts among God's people. Revival is nothing less than a new beginning of obedience to God. That's what has to take place. I need a new place to start, God, a new place of beginning. So how do I deal with that? How do I have a clean house? I clean it out, and then I move forward. You know, God wants to do something in our hearts and our life, but the question remains, will I have this new day of obedience? Will I have this place of revival? Do I find that spiritual deadness creeping in on me like some ghostly fog that kind of settles in around my heart and mind? Do I have a love for God? Do I have a love for sinners? Do I have a love for the Word of God? What's happened to me spiritually? Why have I come to this place in my life? Can we ask those hard questions of ourselves? And can we ask them, not looking for some answer from the world, but an answer from God that says, God, I need you, and I just need you to speak to me, and I need you to deal with me, because I'm certainly not where I need to be. These are the points of the sermon, very quickly, and I said, I really want you to, to capture what we're saying here. You know, purity and reality can come down to this. Are you willing to confess your sin? Are you willing to begin to make dis disciplined, hard decisions to stay away from those things or those places, those situations that always get you in trouble? Are you willing to move to the place of finding people who are mature in Christ and being honest with someone? If you keep coming to the same failure over and over and over, it may well be time for you to find a partner in the faith who can help you. Are you willing to do that? Are you willing to come to the place to heed God's Word? This is what the Bible says. This is what I need to do. Am I willing to seek God with all my heart? God, I want you. I need you. And I'm willing to come to the place to hide his word in my heart. If we're not willing to take some drastic steps of action, then we're not going to go any place whatsoever. I want to close with an illustration I use in our 201 class. And for those who kind of look at these classes as something extraordinary or whatever, you need, you need to get a grip yourself. Amen. The 101 class we're doing this afternoon is an exciting, informational time to hear what God's doing at Believer's Fellowship, how it started, where the vision came, where God's taken us, and how we operate. The 201 class is teaching people how to come to spiritual maturity in their life by taking and developing some disciplines, 
some real choices like we talked about, to break the old habits, to rely on the Word of God and begin some new habits. But one of the things we talk about in that 201 class, which is coming up in about a month, is the Word of God and the importance of God's Word. There's five points I tell folks about the Bible. One, you need to listen to here. You need to listen to it. It's in sermon, it's in lift group, small group, women's Bible study, men's Bible study. Listen to the Word of God. It starts there. But this is a sword, and you can't hate a sword, hold a sword with a thumb. You're not going to have a grip. Satan's going to come along, first clash the sword, yours falls out. So you listen to the Word of God. And then, not only just hearing it, the next part comes, this is novel, I know for some, reading the Word of God. Now I've got a little bit of a grip, but not much. I'm not going to stand very long. So I not only need to progress from hearing the Word of God, reading the Word of God, I need to study the Word of God. You say, what's the difference between studying and reading? A pencil and a piece of paper. <laughs> That's where it starts. You take notes. How does this apply to me? And we teach this in this class. How do you get in the Word of God? How do you make it applicable? What are, those, what are those fundamental principles in scriptures and how do I communicate them to my heart and my mind and my life? So now I got a little bit of the Word of God. I'm hearing and I'm reading and now I'm beginning to study the Word of God. That's a little better grip. That's not what you need. The next step is to memorize the Word of God. What? I can't memorize it. You know your social security. You know your driver's license. You know your address. You know your phone number. At least 10 other phone numbers. All right. You know all those things. You memorize all kinds of, you know every password for your computer just about. You know. You know. But I can't memorize. You know why you can't memorize anymore? Because you let yourself go stupid. You can't let yourself go stupid. You can't. And it's easy to do. And the way you let yourself go stupid is turn the TV on and watch it all day. You just go, what happens? <laughs> stupid. We make a bumper sticker. Stupid happens. <laughs> It does. It happens real quick. All you got to do is just neglect the Word of God. You get stupid real fast. So what do you do? You start memorizing the Scripture. You start using the brain. And the more you memorize Scripture, the more your brain functions properly. You know? And the more God begins to put this into your spirit and your heart and mind. Thy Word have I hid in my heart. You can't hide anything in your heart unless you memorize it. All right? Jesus, in dealing with the temptation in the wilderness, spoke the Word of God from memory to the devil. When the that's, that's pulled his sword against the enemy. It's the same thing you do. You hear it. You read it. You study it. You memorize it. And you meditate on it. Then you've got a grip. It can't be easily knocked out by the enemy. How do you meditate on Scripture? You memorize it and you begin to personalize it. You begin to put it in your heart. You begin to realize the aspects of every part of that verse and what it means to you. You put your name in there when it talks about you and them or whatever it is, and you personalize For God so loved Joe Arns. That God gave Jesus his only begotten son. That Joe Arms could be saved and be given eternal life. You just chew on it. You know, cows, and this is where the word meditation comes from. It comes from a word that has to do with rumination. Cows, they go out and they eat grass. You know, they got multiple stomachs. They chew the grass up. I tell you what, that's what some of y'all look like in church chewing your gum when I'm up here. <laughs> You're ruminating, aren't you? You chew on it, and then the cow goes, sits down in the shade, and swallows it down that first stomach, and he sits down in the shade for a little bit, and while he's down in his stomach, he pulls it up. Just burps up that, and what develops is this, what they call the cud. All right? And you, the cow just chews on that cud. And more chews on it, the more the nutrition and the vital nutrients for its life are given out of it. And the, eventually the next time, then up again, you know, chews on some more. Eventually the last stomach when he's gotten everything out of it that can be got. That's what it means to meditate on Scripture. You take a verse that you think you just squeeze it dry. What it means? What God's saying to you? Is there a promise to, to, to believe there? Is there, is, there, is there a portion to be obeyed there? Is, is there? is there a truth to stand on there? Is there comfort in, in an affliction? Whatever it is, you just memorize it and put it in your heart and life. Go to bed. You want to memorize and meditate on scriptures? You go to bed. People tell me before, well, I have trouble going to sleep at night. Hey, you start memorizing scripture at night, the devil will put you to sleep. <laughs> Amen. He doesn't want you doing that. Beats Ambien. God is so good to us that I wonder how many of you would be willing today to commit to something I talked about earlier in the message to say, I need to go have that time of, 
a spiritual bath in my life by confessing things. I, I, need, I, I need to really be the person who gets alone with God and spends some time with Him again, just gets the house clean, gets the hidden things out, the stuff I've just accepted that's really not God didn't accept, things I've just called acceptable when they're not. And God's talked to me about it before and I ignored Him. And I'm willing to make that list and I'm willing to confess it before God and just say, God, I need you. I need a revival. I need an outpouring of refreshness on, on, on my life. I need you. See what God does in your life. See if God doesn't transform your life. I want us to stand with our heads bowed this morning. Perhaps you're here and you've never even given your life to Christ.